Yeah, just in case you didn't, you missed what Jason said there at the very beginning, please mark your calendars for December 12th. That's going to be our first official membership meeting. Very important, our first membership meeting for ACC as an independent church. So uh, please mark your calendars for that. Um, <clears throat> so this Sunday is our last Sunday in the series we've been doing called Rediscovering Jesus and His Church. And uh, next week we're going to start a new series, our Advent series. Do you guys realize that Advent is here? That Christmas is right around the corner? Uh, kind of crazy. But uh, yeah, next Sunday we're going to start an Advent series and we're going to call it The Mothers of Jesus. And what I mean by that is not that Jesus had more than one mother, but if you look at Matthew's genealogy, um, Matthew lists five women in that genealogy, which was very unusual for an ancient genealogy. And so each week we're going to look at one of those women, one of these uh, descendants of Jesus, and we're going to look at their story and how their stories ultimately prepare us and lead us to the birth of Jesus. So I'm excited for that. Uh, please come uh, next Sunday. We'll start that series. But, but today, <clears throat> we're going to wrap up our series here. And so what we've been doing is we've been looking at these seven letters that Jesus sends to the seven churches. And last week was the seventh letter, okay? So we've read all the letters to the seven churches but I wanted to add one more um, sermon to the series because what happens after, right after uh, Jesus sends these letters to the churches, is that Jesus uh, shows John, who wrote Revelation, a vision, kind of a crazy vision. And, um, <clears throat> you know, when we were starting this uh, series on Revelation, some of, you, some of you guys came up to me and was like, oh, you know, I'm kind of excited about this series because I always wanted to hear a sermon sermons on Revelation because Revelation is very uh, fascinating to us because it has all these crazy visions, right? These crazy uh, symbols and images, and we're all like, what does it mean, right? What's the code? What's the secret code that's going to show us how the end of the world is going to look like? And, you know, I think what we forget when we think about Revelation is the purpose of those visions and all those images. Because what's the purpose? The purpose that God shows these visions is to encourage these churches. These seven churches, these seven struggling churches, uh, discouraged churches are getting persecuted. Some of them are doing well. Right? And, and Jesus says, good job, right? Some of them are struggling and they're doing very poorly and Jesus calls them out, right? But they're discouraged, struggling Christians being persecuted and Jesus says, I want you to see something. Right? I want you to see something. And that's the purpose of this vision. And so, so as we look at this vision, I want you to think about uh, your own life right now. Okay, I want you to think about um, what are the ways right now that you're discouraged, a little bit discouraged, right? What are the ways that, um, you know, you, you have some stuff on your mind right now that's really weighing you down, that you're worried about? And what are some temptations you're struggling with? Right now, maybe there's some anger, unresolved tensions, fears, insecurities, right? And I want you to bring that with you as you look at this vision, okay? And let's ask God, what do you want me to see in light of my issues, my struggles, okay? So let's, let's read, let's, let's, uh, let's see this vision, and let's, uh, let's ask God to, to teach us. So Revelation chapter 4, verse 1 to 11. <clears throat> After this, I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I had heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne stood in heaven, with one seated on the throne. 
And he who sat there had the appearance of jasper and carnelian, and around the throne was a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald. Around the throne were 24 thrones, and seated on the thrones were 24 elders, clothed in white garments with golden crowns on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder, and before the throne were burning seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was, as it were, a sea of glass like crystal. And around the throne, on each side of the throne, are four living creatures, full of eyes in front and behind. The first living creature like a lion, the second living creature like an ox, the third living creature with the face of a man, and the fourth living creature like an eagle in flight. And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all around and within, and day and night they never cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who is seated on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They cast their crowns before the throne saying, Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things. And by your will, they existed and were created. All right, let's pray. Dear God, Lord, we thank you <clears throat> for bringing us here this morning. Uh, we thank you, God, for uh, bringing us through this week. Um, and God, we pray, God, that now you would uh, encourage us. You would strengthen us. You would refresh us through your holy word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so uh, here at the beginning of this passage in verse 1, right, it connects it to what we just read, right? Because in verse 1 it says, after this, after I got all these seven letters, I looked, right, and behold, a door standing in heaven, right? So John, he sees this door, right, and he steps through the door, and behind the door is this vision, Right, the vision of God's throne room. Right? And uh, this vision, it's kind of crazy, right? It's got these crazy images there. And uh, what you've got to realize is that if you look at the Old Testament, especially like Isaiah and Ezekiel, there's a lot of the same kind of images. And those are also visions of God. And so you've got to look at the Old Testament and how those, what are the symbols there. But, but let's look at this. What, what are all these images uh, this, Im this vision of God on his throne, what do they mean? What is God trying to show the seven churches? And what is God trying to show us? Okay, the first thing God is trying to show us through this vision is this. God is holy. God is holy. Okay, so John, <clears throat> he sees God sitting on the throne, right? And it says that God, in verse 3, had the appearance of jasper and carnelian, and around the throne was a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald. Okay, so these are all like precious jewels, right? And if you look at the Bible, you see these uh, precious jewels in other places, and they all symbolize splendor and majesty, right? And, and, and John, what does he also see and hear? He sees in uh, verse 5, flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder, right? And that should remind us of uh, Mount Sinai in the Old Testament because on Mount Sinai, the Israelites also saw God descending on this mountain and they saw lightning and they saw thunder and they were afraid and they were trembling because this shows God's fearsome power. And what else does John see? He sees these 24 thrones around God's throne, and he sees these uh, 24 elders sitting on them. Okay? Uh, and this probably means, represents these 24 angelic beings, but that number is, is, very, uh, is very intentional, 24. Right? And what, 
uh, that 24 probably symbolizes is the 12 tribes in the Old Testament and then the 12 disciples in the New Testament. Right? Because if you look at Revelation, uh, the end of Revelation, there's also the 12 and the 12. The 12 um, also put together there uh, in the vision of the new heavens, new earth, the 12 tribes and the 12 disciples. And what does that mean? You put them together, it just means all of God's people, right? In the Old Testament, God's people were the 12 tribes. In the New Testament, the disciples kind of were the foundation of the church, right? So it just means all of God's people surrounding God on his throne, and they're all bowing down and worshiping him, right? And then we see these crazy uh, creatures, did you see that, right? Kind of crazy, right? You got, the, you got one creature, they got all these eyes, right? And they, and they got a face of a lion, an ox, and a man, and an eagle. And they got these wings. And you see creatures like this elsewhere, uh, also in other visions, like in Isaiah and Ezekiel. All right, what's, what's the point of these creatures? Um, in other places, they're called like cherubim or seraphim. Right? I think the, the, the main point, don't get too uh, sidetracked by like, they, they look so weird, right? I think the point is that these are these magnificent, powerful, glorious creatures, right? And what are they doing? These crazy, powerful, magnificent creatures, otherworldly creatures, what are they doing? They are bowing down to God, right? And they are crying out, Day and night, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Right? And what does God want to show us through this? I think God wants to show us. He wants us to see and remember, I am powerful. I'm glorious. Right? Right? Uh, I am full of splendor. And you put all that together and summarize in that one word, it means God is holy. He's above us. He's absolutely different from us. The only response to God's holiness and power, right, is to fall on your face. Right? And just worship Him. Um, <clears throat> did you know that each year, 35,000 people uh, visit Mount Everest in Nepal? And that's a lot of people. I mean, that's, uh, it's, that's a pretty crazy climb to, tr to go up Mount Everest. But 35,000 people every year try to do that. Uh, did you know that 4.5 million people every year go to the Grand Canyon? And 3.5 million people go to Yos Yosemite? And 30 million people go to Niagara Falls. Right, have you ever been to a place like that? Right? I mean, why do people, year after year, flood these places? Right? Why do we love to go to these uh, awe-inspiring, glorious experiences? I think it's because all of us there's something in all of us that craves that kind of experience, right? When you just stand there in front of this huge, you know, canyon all around you or this gigantic waterfall or you go to the top of a mountain and you look down and it's just like clouds below you and blue sky all around you. And how does that make you feel when you, when you experience something like that? You feel... Uh, small. You feel uh, insignificant, but in a good way, right? You actually kind of feel like you're you're tiny, right? I mean, you ever like just look at all the stars if on like a if you're out in the middle of, of nowhere and you see all these stars and then you just kind of feel small, but it's like you actually it feels good. It feels freeing to think of yourself as so small and ex insignificant. Why is that? You know, there's actually a, a scientist at UC Irvine that did a study 
on why, why, we, why we like those kind of awe-inspiring experiences so much. And they did this study, and they actually interviewed all these people who, uh, who go to these kind of like awe-inspiring experiences in nature, and then they studied how it affected them. And this is the conclusion of that scientific study. Um, it says, we found that some sorts of effects, the same sorts of effects in these people, that people felt smaller, less self-important, and behaved in a more pro-social fashion. Right? When you, when you expose yourself to these experiences, these people actually were more, uh, more dialed into the needs of people around them. They're more pro-social. They cared more about their friends and their family. They're less absorbed into their own needs and their feelings. I think God wants us to see when he shows us this vision of his, his glory, right? And you just bow down and you just feel small and insignificant before this God. I think he wants to draw us out of ourselves, and draw us out of our own needs and our worries and our anxieties. You know, maybe all of us, maybe all of us would do us some good to get outside more often. Right? Turn off the screen. Put the phone in the drawer. And just go take a walk. And breathe the fresh air. Right? I do this, I try to do this uh, every morning before I go to the office. No matter how much work I have to do, I will go and I'll take a walk and I'll hike up this mountain and just breathe in the fresh air and try to get away from the noise of the traffic, right? And probably just remember I, you know, who, who I am. I'm just a person in the midst of God's creation. God is holy. Second thing God wants us to see in this vision <clears throat> as he sits on his throne is this, that God is sovereign over the world. God is uh, on his throne over the world, right? So those four crazy creatures, what are they saying as they are bowing down to God on his throne? They're saying, verse 8, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come, right? Who is God? He's the God who was in the past. He is right now, and he is to come, right? God is like, man, I was here before you were born. I was here before your mom and dad was born. I was, before, I was here before your ancestors were born, right? And I'm going to be here after you die, long after you're just ashes buried in the ground. I will be here. Right? He is eternal. Right? He's seen countries and rulers and presidents and dynasties and political parties all come and rise and then they fall and God outlasts them all. God is eternal. He is timeless. Right? What, are, what are the 24 elders? What are they bowing down before God? What are they saying? It says in verse 11, Worthy are you, o our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. By your will, all things exist. Right? Everything, Right? exists by the will of God. He is in control. He is sovereign. Right? You know, imagine you're, you're one of these churches, uh, these seven churches. Remember, they lived in the Roman Empire. Right? They lived in the, under the thumb of the Roman Empire that was persecuting them, that was like getting ready to kill some of them. Right? The emperor was like, the emperor thought that he was God. Right? And then God shows them this vision of the real throne. Right? Why does, he sh why does God show them this vision? I think 
God is trying to show them. Like, I know you look around the world and it seems kind of crazy. And you're worried about what's going to happen. You read the news and you get stressed. Right? It looks like everything is falling apart, but I, I, let me show you something. Let me show you something. Let me draw back the curtains. I'm still on the throne. I will always be on the throne. Right? The emperor thinks he's king. I'm king. Uh, how have you felt the past five years with all the crazy stuff in the news? I don't know about you, all right? But I feel like it's been probably the craziest five years in this world that I've experienced. Um, right? It's probably shaping a whole generation. Or are they, or they going to call the next one? Generation Z is probably going to be Generation COVID or something like that, right? <laughs> because the last, just think about, well, think about all the stuff that's happened in the last like three years. We've had a global pandemic. We've had racial protests and unrest unlike we've seen in a long time. We've seen uh, an attack on the White House. And on top of that, I feel like uh, technology is advancing at a, at a pace that it's like never been at before. Like there's all these new things coming out and it's changing the way, of, the way we do everything. Like I really feel like the world is changing faster than it has, than I can remember. Have you guys heard about uh, the metaverse? Probably maybe heard that. All right, I was reading an article about it this week, trying to get my mind around it, right? Like Facebook, the company uh, they, is called Meta now, right? And so I'm prob- I might be getting some of this wrong, but this is what I, what I understand. And if you're a, a tech person, you can correct me if I'm wrong. So the metaverse is supposed to be like the future of the internet, right? In five to 10 years, the internet's going to be different, right? And what we're moving towards is, is that everything is going to be all this kind of, um, with a combination of super fast internet, right? With like augmented reality, and virtual reality, and all these new ways to interact and to like go to concerts kind of virtually and to do things in new ways, and that's going to be the metaverse. And you know, I th- you know, in a lot of ways, it sounds pretty cool, right? Like, yeah, there's some, a lot of cool ways to do new things, but I don't know about you, it kind of scares me. <laughs> it kind of kind of freaks me out. Right, because I feel like technology is really, uh, it's, I'm, I'm like, are people even going to like hang out with each other anymore? Are they going to like meet up for coffee anymore? Or are we just going to put on like our VR goggles and be like, hey, I'll meet you for coffee, you know, at, on this app. And then you'll, you won't even look like you. You'll, you'll look like something else. You'll look like your avatar, Right? And I don't know, like that, that kind of freaks me out. Technology freaks me out a little bit. The other day, my kids, right, my kids are 7 and 10, right? And we have Alexa, and they know how to use Alexa for everything, right? And they're praying, and they said, dear Alexa, <laughs> when they're praying, right? Because they're just kind of confused because they talk to Alexa sometimes, and, they, and, they're, and they're praying, and they laughed. They're like, oh, I can't believe I said that, right? But... I don't know, that kind of scared, that kind of freaked me out, right? <laughs> like, yeah, this te- the technology is changing so much, right? I was also watching this, uh, uh, this documentary, right? Uh, so I think I've told you guys this, but I really liked The Mandalorian on Disney+, Plus, right? And uh, I'm just going to spoil it for you. Everyone knows, right? The, the last episode... <laughs> Oh, I won't spoil. I won't, I won't say. But they used this kind of technology on the last episode called deepfake. And what deepfake technology is that you can kind of superimpose the facial features onto someone's real face and make them look like, like, they, like they looked like 30, 40 years ago. Right? And th- 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 I was watching the documentary on it, and th- they were talking to John Favreau, the, the director. And the director was like, or the producer, or whatever his title is, right? He was like, you know, it's pretty good right now, deep fake technology. But in a couple of years, you won't be able to tell the difference. No one 
we'll be able to tell the difference between what's like created by uh, technology and what's real. And John Favreau himself was like, honestly, it's scary to me because he knows that some people are going to use that for bad purposes. Right? And I don't know about you, when I think about some of this stuff, I, I get a little bit fearful. I get a little bit anxious. But what I think God wants us to see, even as we look around at this world and all this crazy stuff going on, is he's saying, man, I don't, this stuff doesn't worry me. This doesn't phase him, all the stuff that's going on down here. He's still on his throne. All this stuff is going to come and it's going to go, just like the Roman Empire. Right? The Roman Empire thought they were going to rule the world. What's the Roman Empire now? You can go to Rome and you can visit what the Roman Empire is now. It's like ruins that you go to take pictures of on vacation. It's gone. Right? Stuff's going to come. It's going to go. Right? People are going to do good and beautiful and constructive things. At the same time, people are going to do harmful and destructive things. But God's still going to be on his throne. I think God wants us to, to see this. I, he's like, look around. I know things are crazy. I know, th- I know you're worried. Maybe you're worried for your kids. Maybe you're scared of the Roman Empire. Maybe you're scared of what's going on and the news just stresses you out. But all I'm calling you to do is just be faithful to me. Be faithful to the king. Don't be afraid. Don't be angry. Don't get sucked into all the yelling and fear-mongering and demonizing out there. Just be faithful to me. Just preach the gospel. Just love one another. Don't, just keep gathering together. Remember, a Hebrew says, don't neglect to gather together, right? Just love one another, meet face to face, even if it's awkward and uncomfortable, and love one another as I have loved you. And just keep doing that. And you know what? Some people are going to think you're weird. But at the same time, some people are going to be attracted to you. Because you know what? People are going to get tired. They're going to get tired of always having to craft and create their own identity and hiding behind your avatar or your social media image. Isn't that tiring? They're going to be tired of that. They're going to want something else. A place where you can come and you can just be yourself in the flesh and you will be accepted. People are going to be tired of just always being angry all the time. Aren't you tired of just being angry all the time? And they will come and they will hear about my kingdom. And my kingdom will advance in my timing, in my way, in my plan. God is sovereign over the world. So don't be afraid. Just be faithful. Right? God is sovereign over the world. Lastly, right, what God wants us to see, not just that God is sovereign on his throne over the whole world, but he wants us to see this. God is sovereign over your life. God is still on his throne over your life. <clears throat> so he's not just on the throne of the whole universe and of like politics and, and rulers and authorities and history. He's also on the throne when it comes to the details of your life. 
He's on the throne of your life and the way it's going, no matter how you feel about it today. And, you know, we can talk about God's sovereignty all day. Like, you can talk, you can wax eloquently about it. You can have theological debates on it, right? But when it comes down to it, I think a lot of us, no matter what you say, we don't actually believe in God's sovereignty. We don't actually believe that God is on his throne. Because how do we react when things don't go our way? I think that shows whether you believe that God is on his throne or not. Right? I mean, I think that we're actually more like, um, a lot of times I'm like this, I'm more like Abraham in the Old Testament. Do you remember the story of Abraham in the Old Testament? And God promises Abraham and Sarah, they're these like really old, this really old couple, right? And God comes to them and says, I'm going to give you a baby. Right? Even in your old age, I'm going to give you a baby. And through this baby, I'm going to fulfill my promise to the world. This baby's going to become a people. Right? And at first, they're, they, they accept it and they believe their promise. But what happens? Time goes by, years pass, and they're like, I'm getting a little impatient here, God. When's this going to happen? And what do they do? Sarah says to Abraham, you know, why don't I just give you my servant Hagar, and you can have a kid with her, right? And say so they take matters into their own hand because they're impatient. But what happens? Of course, God does give them a child, a miraculous, supernatural child later, right? But it was his plan, and they wanted to manipulate things into their own plan. You know what? How many, don't we often do that ourselves? We're like, God, okay, when's this going to happen? Let's move things forward. Maybe I need to do some more stuff instead of just waiting on you. How do you react when unexpected things come in your life, things that kind of throw off your plans. All right, I'm, I'm a parent of a, of a two-year-old. I mean, how do I react when she doesn't take a nap? When I've been waiting all day for two hours to finish my work or to do this and she doesn't take a nap, how do I react? Do I become irritable? And angry? Do we just get really anxious? Become crippled by anxiety? Do we try to just take things into our own hands when we need to just let them go? Do we try to become controlling and try to subtly manipulate people when we should just let it go? Right? Do we overwork? and burn out when we should just maybe take a break and rest. You see, all those, what, what do all those responses tell us? That t they tell us that we don't really want God to be on the throne. We want to be on the throne. Right? And when, when, when things aren't going the way we want them to be, we're like, God, right? Like, what are you doing? Right? I had everything planned just the way I wanted them to be. But God's way is always better than our way. It's always better than our way. Right, famous verse from Romans 8. You've probably heard it before, right? And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Right, all things in your life, even if they're painful or inconvenient, God is working them according to his purpose. But what, what's the next verse? What is his purpose? What is his purpose in doing the things that he's doing? Verse 29, for, God, for those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. God wants to shape you and mold you to be like Jesus, right? And all those things happening in your life, right? God is trying to 
maybe whittle some things down in your heart, in your life. He's trying to mold you and to shape you to be more like Jesus. And he's saying to us in those moments, you know, do you trust me? Do you trust that I'm trying to work on you here? I'm trying to form you. I'm trying to form your character and form your patience, even in this difficulty. I'm trying to grow things in you that need to be grown. I'm trying to walk with you through that uncertainty. And my way is better than your way. God is on the throne. Do you believe that? Do you believe God is on the throne right now no matter what's going on in this world? Do you believe that God is on the throne of your life? And that everything happening in your life, God has a purpose. And he's shaping you and he's molding you. Will you trust him? Will you submit to him? Let's pray. God, Lord, we, we come to you this morning <clears throat> with all sorts of stuff going on in our lives, different things. Some, some great, maybe some of us are having a great life right now, right? Things are going to plan. And some of us, nothing is going to plan. Lord, we want to come before you and bring all of our doubts and all of our fears and insecurities and worries to you right now. And God, we just ask that you would just make these words a reality in our hearts. God, would you just help us to meditate on this picture of you sitting on your throne? God, would you draw us out of our selfishness, our self-absorption? God, would you draw us out of our bitterness and our anger? Help us to embrace the difficulties. Help us to embrace this forming process that you are doing right now in our lives. God, thank you for being on the throne. Let's take some time to pray and to respond right now as you are hearing God speaking to you.